Good afternoon or good morning, depending on your location. Welcome to the Farm Service Agency's Coronavirus Food Assistance Program for Specialty Crop Producers webinar. My name is Latrice Hill, and I serve as the National Director of Outreach for USDA's Farm Service Agency. Presenting with me today, we have Janae Prescott, who is a National Program Specialist with our Farm Programs Division. For today's webinar, all participants are in listen-only mode, but are able to submit questions through the chat box. We will answer as many questions as we can, but depending upon time, we may have to follow up you with you later on a response. As a reminder, there is a frequently asked questions page that is located on farmers.gov forward slash CFAP that may have some of the answers that you're looking for. Please take a look at that page before submitting any additional questions. Also, please note that this webinar is being, re is being recorded and will be posted online for public use and download later. Today's discussion will cover the basics of what is the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program and what is ANOFA? What is this notice of funding availability? How can producers submit additional commodities? And exactly what does CSAP have to offer for specialty crop producers? So let's get started first with the basics. What is Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CSAP, as we commonly refer to it? You know, in response to the CARES Act, CSAP was developed to assist farmers, ranchers, and ag producers um, because of this horrific pandemic called COVID-19, which has impacted ag operations across the world in so many ways. Well, you know, here in the United States, this CFAP program will work to address two challenges that our producers have faced from the virus, and that is one, price declines, and two, supply chain disruption. The pandemic has caused both a decline in demand and in some commodity and commodities and affected the market supply chain. Some producers may have had challenges in getting products to market before they spoiled or had to dump milk from contracts before getting canceled, or uh, some may have been affected because of school and restaurant closing. But as we know, there, there really isn't any program that's going to make us all whole again, but this program does provide some relief through direct payments and will cover a portion of the impact to farmers and ranchers. To ensure funds serve as many producers as possible, producers whose applications are approved will receive 85% of their total maximum payment now up to the program payment limit, and any additional will be determined by the secretary at a later date. So to share some general program information before we go into details, FSA is accepting application for, applications for the program through August 28th. Applications um, will be considered uh, once they are received and processed, and we want to ensure that producers are able to apply and have questions answered before the, the sign-up deadline of August 28th. Because the agency is working uh, to relieve as many producers as possible, as quickly as possible, to get help out there as quick as we can. FSA is not requiring a lot of documentation that normally would be required to participate in programs. So a lot of required documentation for the losses uh, that are normally reported will not be required for this CFAP application. See, producers will self-certify that the information is accurate. However, we do encourage all producers to maintain and keep on hand any documentation that they may have because it may be needed later for documentation. Once the application has been submitted, uh, any outstanding forms or issues or anything regarding eligibility has 60 days to be resolved. 
um, from the date that the producer is actually signing the application. It's important to keep in mind that um, producers who have an interest in an operation should apply individually. For example, if a producer is operating within a cooperative structure, then growers should apply individually to the program. And one other thing to note that it's important that you apply in the office where your records are located. And you may say, well, I don't have records. My records aren't located anyway. I'm new to FSA. Where do I go to apply? You will apply at the local FSA service center in the county where your crop is grown. So to talk about eligibility, eligible producers must have ownership um, in the, the commodities um, in which, oh, I'm sorry, uh, could we back up one slide, please? I think we're, there we go. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's important that you know that FSA has identified commodities that are el eligible for payments uh, by identifying commodities that have experienced 5% or greater national uh, price decline as a result of COVID-19, or commodities that have had substantial marketing costs to inventory. Please note that this is not applicable for specialty crop categories two and three. And we're gonna talk about categories and um, the specifics of specialty crops in just a moment, but I just wanted to make note of that that this is not applicable for the specialty crop categories two and three. FSA sought to identify all available price data, including prices collected by USDA and commodities traded on the futures markets. So the 5% decline in futures prices for these identified commodities occurs between the weeks of January 13th through the 17th and April 6th through the 9th. The covered commodities include dairy, livestock, non-specialty crops, wool, and specialty crops. Now there is a full listing on the uh, farmers.gov forward slash CFAP website, uh, but just to give you some idea of what some of those non-specialty crops are would be uh, malting barley, canola, corn, upland cotton, uh, millet, oats, sorghum, soybeans, sunflowers, durum wheat, um, and payments for those specialty crops that are available but not limited to include almonds, beans, broccoli, sweet corn, lemons, iceberg lettuce, spinach, squash, strawberries, tomatoes, in addition to the dairy, cattle, lambs, yearlings, wool, hogs, and pigs. Again, a complete listing is available online at www.farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. A producer does not need to be an existing USDA customer. Um, processing entity, entities are ineligible. Uh, just one thing to note that producers who may have been in the midst of filing for bankruptcy or closing operations, but we're still operating within that mid-January through mid-April period can still apply. And a question that we've received from several producers, uh, they wanted to know, you know, how does this impact, um, will applying for CFAP have any implications if they have already previously applied for SBA's programs, you know, there was the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, and then IDLE, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Uh, please note that participation in these programs does not impact your eligibility for CFAP or for any USDA farm program. So I thought that was important to, to make note of. We've had a lot of people to ask that question. Payment limitations per person or 250,000. Now it's different from other FSA programs. Some participants like corporations, LLCs, corporate entities are subject to special payment limitations. These categories can receive up to 750,000 
based on the number of shareholders, not to exceed three, who contribute at least 400 hours of active person management or active labor. This next slide tells you a little bit about commodities that are not eligible, um, specialty crop categories, two and three are not required to meet the 5% price decline. And again, we're going to talk about categories in just a second. But this just gives you uh, an idea of some of the commodities that currently are not available or eligible for CFAP. Uh, and that includes sheep more than two years old, eggs, layers, soft red winter wheat, hard red winter wheat, white wheat, rice, flax rye, peanuts, Seed barley, EOS cotton, alfalfa, forage crops, hemp, and tobacco. A very important note, USDA may reconsider these excluded commodities if credible evidence is provided that supports a 5% price decline. I repeat, USDA may reconsider these excluded commodities if credible evidence is provided that supports a 5% price decline. So the payments, of course, as I mentioned before, are not expected to make producers whole or to compensate them for all of their losses. But what it is designed for is to give producers some immediate financial relief. Another question that we've received quite a bit and that's important to know is that if a producer has outstanding debts with USDA, they should still apply for this program if they're eligible because their payments will not be withheld to satisfy any USDA debts. So that is important to know um, and do know that this is not a loan program and is not expected to be repaid. No fees are applicable to apply for this program. Not all specialty crops or commodities were included in the CFAP program rule. USDA needs assistance in identifying additional commodities that experience lost, loss or market disruption. FSA has issued a notice of funds availability which we often call a NOFA. And this will allow producers an opportunity to provide information on unlisted crops for consideration into the program. This NOFA is a request for information. USDA needs more information to determine whether other commodities experience loss or market disruption to qualify to be a covered commodity under CFAP. So this call for data actually gives producers who grow commodities not currently eligible for CFAP the unique opportunity to submit data on production, inventory, prices, and market disruption. And if that is approved, then the new commodity will be added to the listing of eligible crops, and producers will have an opportunity to then apply. There is a NOFA fact sheet that is posted on our uh, farmers.gov CFAP site, which we'll cover later as we talk about resources. Uh, but it, <clears throat> that fact sheet provides the online portal where comments and data may be uploaded and submitted online on the regulations.gov page. And it also provides the address to where written documentation can be submitted and mailed to USDA. The, the, the deadline to submit this information is June 22nd. That's a very important date to remember. June 22nd is the last day to submit additional commodities. Now, I, I wanted to just mention here that a corrected NOFA is being um, provided. It should post hopefully this week. But it's being updated to add additional questions for certain crop producers, specialty crop producers, to respond to as part of the comment process. Um, it adds the following two questions, uh, and again, this is going to be applicable to certain specialty crop producers. Once you read the NOFA and the requirements, then you'll know uh, a little bit more about which groups um, these questions would pertain to. But the questions are, one, 
provide the quantity and price of the crop you produced that left your farm by April 15th and subsequently spoil or unpaid due to no market and for which you do not have federal crop insurance or non-insured crop disaster assistance coverage for loss. And two, the quantity and price of crops ready for sale that didn't, did not leave the farm by April 15th. Um, these, these are two uh, of the questions that have been added um, to the NOFA process. Again, we are hoping that that will post um, in the next day or two, uh, but that is important for any specialty crop producer or any producer that wants to submit additional commodities for consideration. Special emphasis, I will say, is uh, placed on data that is needed for nursery and aquaculture, as well as cut flower products. So now I'd like to bring in uh, Janae Prescott, who, again, as I mentioned, is one of the uh, program specialists here in headquarters, uh, to talk to us uh, about the specifics of specialty crops. So, Janae, I, I see one of the first slides you have here is talking about three different categories for eligible specialty crops. Uh, can you expand on that for us, please, and explain these three categories? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so as Latrice said, we have the three categories. And our first category is going to cover the commodities that Latrice was talking about that met that 5% um, or greater price decline. We're going to capture the commodities that were sold. So any commodity that met that 5% or greater decline that was sold from January 15th to April 15th is going to be captured in Category 1. I'm moving to Category 2. This is where we're going to capture any commodity that was delivered and that spoiled or was unpaid. So let me re re reiterate that it was delivered um, between January 15th and April 15th and was either spoiled or unpaid. And then on to our third category, that would be not delivered. So any um, commodity that was left on the farm, um, a shipment that did not leave the farm, or any acres that remained unharvested as of April 15th, um, 2020, would be categorized under Category 3 as a not delivered commodity. And we can find those commodities and the categories that they would be eligible for at farmers.gov slash CFAP slash specialty. Okay, Janae, so for payments, um, that's probably one of the biggest questions people have. You know, how do they determine if uh, they're eligible for payment? Uh, which one of these categories should they be in? Um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, the best place to refer, as you can see on your slide, um, to find out which category your crop falls into um, is to go to the website and, and find out which category um, applies. And each commodity can fall into one or more categories. Um, it's not restricted to one category, so crops can fall into more than one category. Um, if you have crops falling into separate categories or even other commodities, um, like Latrice mentioned, dairy cattle um, or dairy milk and then cattle, all the, all the commodities and under one application are going to have one payment. So one total payment per application. Um, the specialty crops um, that would be paid out are those that experience the losses that Latrice uh, mentioned also. Um, our price was declined, they were spoiled, unpaid, um, or, un or were unharvested. And we are taking a snapshot of it during the time period of January 15th to April 15th of 2020. So that is the time frame we're looking at um, for our commodities that we're going to pay out under this program. And then when you, for our payments, producers are going to get paid on their shares. So when applying for our program, um, the application will only capture the share of the portion of the crop that that producer has. Janae, this and one is thing we want really good. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to say this is some really good information, but I want to make sure that I'm understanding you and that our producers um, on the webinar understand. 
So you're saying it's okay. I'm looking at almonds here. It's okay if I have something that goes across all three categories? Absolutely. Okay. And as far as the ownership part, um, let's just say I have 50% ownership in a crop. Um, does that mean that my payment would be only – that would only cover, let's say, 50 acres? If I had 100 acres uh, with a friend and I own 50% 50 of that crop and 50% ownership in it, does that mean that my payment is only going to be eligible for that 50% and not the entire acreage that we, um, that we grow together? It's just going to be my interest? Um, yes, um, your interest is all that you're going to apply on. Now, 100% of okay. the crop can be eligible, okay. but each producer needs to apply for their share of that crop on their own application. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. And one thing we also want to point out here um, under the payments, as we were talking about the different um, categories and how they're going to be paid out, and we want to make sure that we um, let folks know in the webinar that crops that are in inventory that are available to be sold um, on April 16th um, and that have a future value, those crops are not eligible. So I'll give you like a quick example. We have, you know, apples, potatoes, onions. Those commodities can be stored in like a cold facility where they maintain, um, they don't spoil as easily and they maintain their eligibility and their value to be marketed at a later time. Those crops um, will not be eligible under those buckets of two and three. So that's something that um, is in our rule. We want to make sure we um, make that clear to our participants on the line. And if we want to move to some examples now, we have some examples under our categories. So under our category one, we have the example. Um, actually, first we'll talk about what it means, what that, that is going to cover. It's going to cover 80% of the national price loss. So as this um, slide tells you that, um, that's how the payments were figured under this um, category of the price decline. And you can find it at our website at thefarmers.gov slash CPAP slash specialty um, to make sure you know which crops fall under this category. Um, we've already discussed about um, each producer needs to certify on their own application their shares. And this one's going to be in pounds. So we're going to report pounds under category one or your shares. Um, this also is only going to cover items that are subject to price risk um, that can be reported. And um, we want to make sure that folks on the webinar know that they need to maintain records um, just in case you're pulled for a spot check. Now, this is a self-certification program, but if you're pulled for a spot check, you will want to make sure you have some records on file um, to assist in that spot check process. And some of those are listed on your slide as well. So, Janae, I just want to ask a question. What if I'm a producer who I just don't keep good records? What if I don't have the documentation? Will that prevent me from applying? Um, no, that won't prevent you from applying. Um, you can still apply for the program. As we said, that is a self-certification um, program. However, um, you'll want to make sure that you, if pull for a spot check, you'll be able to provide something um, to help support the production you've reported. Um, and that can be a range of items. Um, AMS will be doing our spot checks in this process, and um, I think they'll be, be able to work with producers to help them um, establish what documentation they will be required to have um, if pulled. But you know, this is self-certification, and anybody um, that wants to self-certify can apply for the program. Okay, thank you. Okay, now if we're ready, I think we can go on to that. Examples is the next one. Okay. We have slide with some examples. Okay, perfect. Okay, and one thing I want to hit on a couple things um, before we get, I actually discuss the example. Um, we talked about in the, that it has to be subject to price risk. So under this, um, basically we're going to say this defines it as if they are under an agreed upon set price before January 15th, and you will be paid out at that price or higher 
then that is not going to be eligible. So once again, if, it's, if you have a set price, agreed upon price on that commodity, and that commodity will be paid out at that price or higher, then it is not eligible. And then I also want to do clarify that it doesn't matter what use the item is sold for. Um, as long as it's sold or marketed during the applicable time period, it's going to be eligible under Category 1. So a quick example of that is lemons um, that's sold as a juice um, that's meant to be a fresh market, but it's sold as a juice or hog feed. Um, that is still going to be a Category 1 eligible commodity. So those are just a couple of things we want to reiterate um, that we've been asked about um, and that we want to make sure our participants on the line and on the webinar um, know that that is our eligibility. Okay, so now we will discuss the example. Um, we have our Francis Farmer um, who has a vegetable operation of tomatoes. 100% um, ownership, 2,000 pounds of tomatoes were sold between our applicable time period of January 15th and April 15th. And so basically Francis Farmer can certify to the 2,000 pounds, which is her 100% of the, the eligible crop as a volume of production sold. And this will be captured on our 803114, our application form in item 32. Okay, so here I am again with a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to make right, sure I'm understanding. <laughs> um, a, a while ago, I was asking about that ownership. So in this case, Frances Farmer has 100% ownership. But if she were in partnership with another person and she had 50% ownership, how would that change this? scenario. Yeah, so if um, Francis Farmer only had 50% of the ownership, um, Francis Farmer would only apply for 1,000 pounds of the volume okay. production sold on the CFAP application, and the other owner of the 1,000 pounds would apply on their own application for the remaining 1,000 pounds. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. You are welcome. So we've All got right. a second okay. example here. Yeah, on Farmer Alex. What can you tell us about this one? Yes, okay, so Farmer Alex on this one um, also has a vegetable operation um, where Alex grows asparagus um, for sale at Farmer's Market. Um, Farmer Alex has 100% of ownership also in um, about 3,000 pounds of asparagus that were sold during our applicable time period. Now, for Alex, um, asparagus is not eligible under Category 1 for CFAP, so Alex will not be eligible um, for the price decline Category 1 on asparagus. So there will be no um, application for Alex on his um, 3,000 pounds of asparagus were sold. Okay, next slide, please. All right, next slide, we're going to cover Category 2, which is the, um, covers the commodities that were delivered and that subsequent, subsequently spoiled and were not paid for. Um, these are going to, this is going to offset roughly 30% of the national sales value that was lost on crops that were shipped from the farm but um, were spoiled or unpaid. Um, and also those also are going to be able to find in our um, table at the website, farmers.gov slash cdfap slash specialty. So you can find those commodities there um, that fall under category two. Um, this one we're going to certify total volume of production in pounds that shipped and that were not sold, um, or un that were not sold, which means unpaid, during January 15th through April 15th. And once again, Latrice, this, you're only going to report your share of the ownership in that crop. Um, and we also want to make sure we keep proper documentation for anything in this category. Shall you be pulled for a spot check? Okay. Good. And what about this doc the documentation? Um, is a letter from the buyer sufficient? Is that something that um, can yeah, be um, submitted? Yes, and like I said once again, AMS is going to be the agency in charge of doing our spot checks for this um, program, and that will have to be a determining factor for them. But yes, a letter from um, a buyer um, usually is a substantial enough evidence 
for documentation that um, for this type of commodity. Great, thanks. Now let's do an example of that. Perfect. Okay, so in this example for um, category two, which is our delivered and boiled or unpaid commodities, Francis Farmer in this situation has 50 pounds of tomatoes that they delivered to a local restaurant. Um, their deliveries were going in on the 1st and 15th of every month um, from January 15th to April 15th. The restaurant paid for shipments received during January and February months. However, beginning with March, the shipments that were going in March and April, the restaurant had limited customers, so the tomatoes boiled, and the Francis Farmer was not paid. So in this situation, Francis Farmer is going to be able to claim 200 pounds of the volume of production shipped but not sold. So that's four total shipments, two in March and two in April, at 50 pounds each that were not paid for and subsequently spoiled um, that will be eligible under item number 33 on the 803114. Okay, I have a question here. So oh. it seems that certain commodities can be stored for for a longer period of time, you know, like um, nuts or apples. Are these things that our producers need to keep in mind, you know, if they grow these type of um, crops, nuts, apples? Yes, that's a great question. And, and that was um, kind of what I was discussing earlier about the items that can be stored in a cold storage or that have a longer um, lifespan that can be sold or marketed at a later time. So these crops, um, if they can be sold or marketed after April 15th, um, they are not eligible under this commodity under this category. Great, thank you. All right, we have another example for ready for example two. Our example two here is back to farmer Alex, um, 100 pounds of asparagus he delivers to one local restaurant on the 1st and 15th of each month. Same thing from February um, 15th through April 15th. The restaurant paid for the shipments received during February, but beginning with the March shipments, um, the restaurant had limited customers and the asparagus spoiled and Alex was not paid. Asparagus is eligible under our category two and Alex Farmer can certify to 400 pounds as a volume of production shipped but not sold on item 33 of the 803114. Okay, um, another question. Um, I'm just trying to pose some different scenarios. We're talking here about a, a restaurant. What if, what if Farmer Alex had shipped it to a wholesaler and the wholesaler packages and sends to schools and you know everything was just left rotting on a pallet in their warehouse would that be applicable yes um for the the commodity had left the farm it had been shipped and um due to coronavirus it was unable to be marketed and it spoiled and there was no payment due to the producer that commodity is eligible okay thanks You're welcome. now let's talk about if if it's not delivered at all. Yeah, so there could be a situation where crops um, were not delivered, as we discussed before. And these ones, this payment is going to offset roughly 5.875% of the national value of unpriced crops that were undelivered and will not be sold. Um, so on this portion of the application, this is a little different. We're gonna take the commodities on this part and we're gonna do numbers of acres. Okay, so this is going to be acres that were left in the field um, or unharvested but not shipped between January 15th and April 15th. And once again, only producers are going to be able to claim their ownership interest in the crops. So total acreage that you have ownership interest in that were left in the field or unharvested, um, that they did not leave the farm um, between April 15th or January 15th and April 15th. And so we can do an example on this one as well. OK. 
Okay, it looks like um, on this example, we're we're back talking about Francis Farmer. I'll let you cover that, Janae. Yeah, absolutely. So this on this one, Francis Farmer um, was selling her tomatoes to a restaurant um, that closed in March, um, leaving her without um, an additional eighth of an acre of tomatoes that weren't able to be marketed. Um, so those tomatoes remained unharvested on Francis Farmer's farm. Francis Farmer, as a result, can certify up to an eighth of an acre of production not shipped or sold. And that, again, is going to be on the AD 3114, and this is item 34. And once again, that's going to be in total acres, not shipped or sold. Okay. Uh, going to throw another scenario at you. Let's say a um, mid-Atlantic farmer had, uh, over the winter, they had kale and collards in the field to be sold to a farmer's market that was going to open on April 1st. The market doesn't open. Is that farmer eligible for CFAP payments? Okay, so... Um Yes, farmers, farmers markets themselves are um, eligible, um, as long as the commodity itself is eligible as, um, as a, a commodity under CFAP. Um, yes, uh, if a farmer's market does not open and the farmer still has those commodities, so if, if it didn't open at all and those commodities were left on the farm, and once again, we have to make sure they're an eligible commodity under CFAP, so we want to check, um, check that website and make sure your commodities that you're wanting to apply for are under that. Um, but yes, if they remained on the farm, either if you, they had been harvested and they just never left the farm, they, they're sitting there and they're gonna spoil due to the farmer's market not opening, or they just were not, um, they were just left unharvested acres, then we um, could accept those on an application um, for payment due to um, them not being delivered to that farmer's market to be sold. Okay, great. Well, I've got one last example I'd like for you to go over, if you don't mind. Sure. So this looks like one where uh, it's not delivered, and again, it's Farmer Alex. And I believe this one's going to be Farmer's Market as well, but I'll, I'll let you read this one. Okay. Absolutely. On this one, um, the farmer's market where Alex normally sells his asparagus um, was due, closed due to the pandemic, um, which left farmers, uh, farmer Alex um, with an acre of asparagus in production that was unable to be marketed to any other buyer, um, and subsequently um, it spoiled due to the fact that the rest, neither the restaurants or markets um, were viable outlets for farmer Alex. Um, the asparagus was harvested and some was donated to a food bank, but the majority was um, composited on the farm. And um, the farmer will apply, so farmer Alex is going to certify to one acre um, as acres of production not shipped or sold on the AD 3114, item 34. All right. Now this is probably uh, a question I should have asked before. I don't know if it's gonna fall into this category, but me being from the south, I'm a, a Mississippi girl, we have a lot of you pick farms around here. So what if I had a you pick farm, um, and you help me out here because I'm not sure which category this would even fall into, but let's just say I had um, asparagus, uh, and, and we, we would not have that in Mississippi, trust me. <laughs> let's say I had um, tomatoes maybe at a you pick farm. Um, what situation or scenario do you think potentially uh, I could fall under, or is that too? Yeah, difficult and to... no, not at all. And yes, you pick farms are eligible. That's um, that is also something that if you have a you pick farm um, and you say school kids or somebody normally comes out and picks your asparagus, I mean due to the fact of COVID, the schools were shut down and those children can no longer come out and pick the asparagus. Um, that is going to be eligible as acres left unharvested. Um, those acres were never harvested um, due to the to the pandemic, and so that will be an eligible commodity, and that would be um, they're not delivered or sold. Great, great. Well, Janae, I, I really do appreciate you uh, 
explaining that and giving us some solid examples that hopefully our producers um, can take on. Uh, we're going to cover just a little bit more before we let folks go, and hopefully we're going to have time for a few questions at the end from producers. But uh, real quickly, I want to finish uh, going through a few more things. Um, general information that I think specialty crop producers should be aware of is that for this, there is no separate organic payment rate. Um, and it's important that you know that it's important that you don't include ineligible crops on your application. Um, if we could get the slide to advance. Um, and I'm sorry, I just realized I can do it myself. Um, <laughs> if, if you have eligible commodities, please go ahead, apply now. Um, you can amend later if more commodities are made eligible through the NOVA. So let's say that you did have, and I'm being very hypothetical here, but let's just say that you did have uh, livestock tomatoes and I don't know why I want to keep saying kumquats. <laughs> Kumquats is not an eligible commodity, but let's say that you were able to submit data for it and provide uh, documentation of how it should be included. Don't wait to apply on that livestock and, and tomatoes. Go ahead and submit that application. If kumquats becomes an eligible commodity, commodity later, then you'll have an opportunity to submit that as well. As we've said over and over today, producers are going to self-certify that their application is accurate, but please, Keep your documentation to be prepared for spot checks that uh, ine inevitably will happen. So make sure that you keep your documentation on hand. And diversified operations. Um, if, again, if you're a diversified farmer, um, we talked a little bit about the payment calculator. The CFAP payment calculator allows you to put all of those things into one file. So if I'm doing cotton, I've got a little dairy here, I've got some tomatoes here, livestock, whatever I have, I'm going to put it all into one file of that uh, calculator. Do not open separate files. Don't do one for livestock, one for dairy, one for tomatoes. Do it all in one file because what that's going to do is populate into an application and you want to have one application covering all of the applicable commodities and livestock that you're applying for. So make sure it stays in one file. Forms and documentation. Okay, this is getting more into what else is needed when you apply. Um, as I said, the most important form is going to be the application form itself, that AD 3114 that Janae talked about quite a bit. And that is automatically generated from that CFAP uh, application generation, generator and payment calculator. That is the most important form. But additionally, there are some other forms that are needed um, in certain situations. Latrice, these, these, yes. Can I make one comment on the application before we move on to other forms real, real quickly? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, as you pointed out, um, for producers to go ahead and apply now um, for any of the commodities that are eligible, um, not to wait. Um, so if you do apply for an eligible commodity under category two and three, and say later on after the NOFA, that, that commodity became eligible under category one, um, you will want to come in and, uh, and do another application um, for payment. So go ahead and, and as Latrice said, apply for the two and three categories now. And then you'll want to um, come in and apply for the Category 1 um, as well on that commodity. So we can do a revised application, and, um, and that will take care of getting that commodity in Category 1. So I just wanted to point that out um, while we're on the application. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Thanks so much for pointing that out. That's very important to know. Um, and, and as I was saying, in addition to that 3114 application, these are a few forms that may be applicable, not in every situation, but they may be applicable. I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about what these forms are. Uh, a CCC 901, when you see that, that is a form that basically identifies the members of a farm that, that is a legal entity. Um, that member information will be completed by legal entities and joint operations to collect the members' names, address, addresses, tax ID numbers, 
in citizenship status. The CCC 941 is what you may hear people say an AGI form. That's adjusted gross income. It reports your average adjusted gross income for programs where income restrictions may apply. The CCC 942, if applicable, this is a certification report uh, that reports income from farming or ranching or forestry, uh, those types of operations for those who exceed the adjusted gross income limitation. The AD 1026, uh, this is a form that ensures compliance with highly erodible land conservation and, and wetland determinations. Um, AD 2047, that is just a basic customer contact information form. And then my personal favorite, and I'm sure it would be yours too, would be the SF 3881. This is the form that you submit your direct deposit information on. This is how you receive your payment. <laughs> so in my book, this is probably, besides the application, the second most important form because you want to be able to tell us how to get that payment to you. All payments are made direct deposit. Now, I will say if, if you are a producer that has done work with FSA, um, which is the Farm Service Agency or Natural Resources Conservation Service, it may be likely that you have some of these forms already on file. So I would suggest that you contact the office first to see if they already have these forms before you begin filling out again. Uh, but if you are a new producer and this is your first time doing business with our offices, more than likely you will not have anything on file. So um, you can go ahead and, as applicable, uh, work through these forms. So a few helpful tools um, I mentioned before, frequently asked questions, and you're going to hear me repeating things, and, and I do this because I really want, these are the things I really want to hammer home to you. Uh, frequently asked questions are updated quite frequently. They have a lot of good information, good questions, answers that our subject matter experts and specialists have provided. It's online at this website. I've mentioned the application generator and the payment calculator that helps you to determine that uh, your, your payment and you enter all of your information to get the estimates. That's also online. And then something that I just wanted to share with you in case you are new to doing business with a Farm Service Agency, um, all of our program regulations are online and available to the public. Uh, so at any time, um, if you just feel the need that you want to read regulations and policy on your own, uh, feel free to go to our website and you can download any of our handbooks with the policy and then notices with any policy changes and updates. So applying, we want you to get help. We know that for some of you this is new and it may sound a little overwhelming, but we don't want it to be. We want it to be easy for you. So a customer help center line has been established. We'll talk about that on the next slide, but it's staffed by field employees. That is available to you to call to get assistance. Uh, right now during the time of COVID, most of our offices are still closed. However, we have been open all of this time by telephone appointments. Uh, each office is staffed with uh, a couple of employees to take phone appointments and work through processing applications. Um, so really work has not stopped for us as offices begin to open up over the next uh, few weeks or a few months. Uh, there may be an opportunity for there to be in-person appointments, but for now it's telephone appointments only. And for those, those producers who have limited English proficiency, we have a language interpreta interpretation line available for non-English speakers. Uh, they simply will call a number um, and the help center will give you that number. Uh, they'll, they'll connect you to that line and you simply press one to state the language that you need um, and two for Spanish speaking producers. A lot of our fact sheets have already been translated and are online in Spanish. Uh, we are identifying additional needs as they become available. And it's also important to know that a lot of our videos 
that are posted to YouTube. There is an option in those videos to um, view in different languages. They're closed captioned in different languages. So that helps those who have uh, limited or non-English speaking proficiency. Also, USDA is, the department is huge. We have several agencies, and all agencies have different partner and stakeholder organizations that are on the ground providing technical assistance to farmers, ranchers, and producers. So this is beyond FSA. This is across the board. A lot of agencies have partners out there who may be able to assist with any questions or needs that you have, whether it's CFAP or another program. Uh, we just want to make you aware that there is assistance there available through partnering organizations. So as I mentioned, that customer call center, uh, FSA formed a, a call center comprised of FSA field staff from around the country and it was really established to just do a little hand holding for producers who may have never done business with us before and have questions about the process. So we feel that the more producers utilize this resource, the better, um, because as I mentioned now, our offices are limited right now to a couple of folks uh, in the office processing applications and they're focusing heavily on the application processing and, you know, of course, they're experiencing a high volume of appointments with our producers. That's to be expected. But we think the best way for you to get information quickly would be by utilizing this customer call center. Uh, they are, they're able to assist you with the forms. Uh, if you're unable to download forms online, they can have it mailed to you. Um, they're able to even connect you with the office that serves the location in your in. So we do ask that you utilize this number, this call center. It's toll free, 1-877-508-8364. Again, new to USDA, um, you may not know it, but to participate in our programs, normally we require something called a farm number. That's when you actually have to set up a farm record uh, with our office and receive a number to apply for any USDA program and receive payment. But you don't have to do that for this program. Uh, there, initially, initially, let me say initially, you do not have to do that. There may be situations um, based on that conservation and highly erodible compliance form. Depending on that, there may be environmental or conservation compliance requirements for you to come back and to establish a farm number. But initially to apply, you do not need a farm number. Again, call that call center for assistance. They will connect you with the local office to schedule an appointment. Uh, they will go over all of the forms which are available online that you can download. They are utilizing a system called the BOTS. Uh, where you're able to upload it back to them. Um, and this, this slide just tells you about different information that's needed and required um, to apply. Demographic information that is optional and voluntary uh, would be an AD Form 2106, which captures race, ethnicity, and gender. And then an FSA, FSA Form 860 is a form that identifies if you're a beginning farmer, veteran, uh, the type of farming segment that you work in. So these are optional demographic forms that are always uh, important and necessary for federal compliance. Order of the events for farmers, we've talked about this. Go online, um, call the, the center or have an application mailed to you, schedule an appointment, Start filling it out, call that customer care center for any assistance you need, any questions about that payment calculator, submit your application for review. Um, if you get an appointment, uh, meet with that uh, official over the phone to get assistance about the application, answer any questions, and then wait for your application to be reviewed, processed, and approved. And once approved, you will receive 80% uh, payment. What happens after I sign the application? Again, as we mentioned before, you have up to 60 days from signing to resolve any other eligibility issues or questions that the local office may have. 
Um, they will begin reviewing your application immediately um, and follow up with any additional information that may be needed. Uh, those approved applications are sent for processing. Uh, you'll be notified um, and provided the, the opportunity to respond to any adjustments needed to production or acreage that may affect your payment. Um, but payments will be uh, sent to you electronically through direct deposit. Tips for success, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's important. Make sure you visit the website to, to view the video of using that payment calculator. There's a video there to show you how to utilize it. Please use that call center. Call them if you have any questions about anything. They're able to assist with that. Take advantage of virtual applications that are located on the Farmers.gov CFAP website online. If needed, we can mail those applications to you. All you need to do is call that 877 number. And again, probably the most important, especially for you specialty crop producers, is to submit information through the NOFA process for any of those unlisted crops that you'd like to have considered. To receive more updates about events, webinars, uh, that our office does uh, nationally. We are the national office. However, there are state offices in each of your states that can assist you. There's a state outreach coordinator. But feel free to subscribe to our newsletters by visiting this website link, fsa.usda.gov forward slash subscribe, enroll, and select outreach and education to get feedback from us. We definitely want to hear your feedback about this webinar to in improve. Um, we hope that it has been helpful and useful to you. Again, this is our first um, of a series of producer webinars on this Thursday. If you or any of your friends are dairy producers or non-specialty crop producers, please invite them to join us on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, on our website, fsa.usda.gov forward slash outreach. You can just click on our webinar, webinars page to register um, and join us on Thursday for that one. Next Tuesday, we will have one for livestock producers and non-specialty crop producers. And on next Thursday, we will follow up, we'll have a wrap up, um, not just on CFAP program, but on all SSA programs that have flexibilities during this coronavirus period. You know, we're focusing on CFAP solely today, but there are other programs we have where we have additional flexibilities that have been given um, that we would like to cover with our producers so that they're made aware of these other program flexibilities. We're not going to have much time for questions. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, I believe all of you have had an opportunity to submit your questions. Uh, what we will do is take these questions and respond to you directly. You can expect to hear back from us shortly. Uh, we appreciate your time, your attention, um, and if we can ever help, just reach out to us. We're here to serve you. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful day.